So, out of popular demand, we are back talking more about Caspa. Caspa! Yeah, I had a lot of great responses from my last video of the red flags that I saw about Caspa. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I'll link it in the description. Things that I'm concerned about with the block DAG slash blockchain. But I did want to do more research into this. I read the Ghost DAG protocol uh, white paper. I read a lot of writings by all of the founders of caspa i also wanted to address all the haters and the sleuths of youtube but i do appreciate your guys comments please if you want to talk trash feel free i have no problem with it i love the discord i did look further and deeper into yonatan sompolinski hopefully i'm pronouncing that correctly and uh does seem like quite a smart intelligent person however there are some things that i also saw as red flags so stay tuned for a second i'm gonna get into all this this is not financial advice do not listen to this and invest your money according to what i'm saying it's only for entertainment purposes now, there is a narrative that is beginning to spread that the United States government has actually found flaws in the security of Bitcoin and the way that the ordinals work and something that the Caspa team has talked a lot about is the security of Bitcoin and how Caspa, I guess, one of the main things is that they are a competitor. They want to be the competitor to Bitcoin. And Yonatan actually said himself, he said, I quote, I agree with concerns voiced by some community members that in principle to bring real value efforts should be focused on integration, adoption, marketing. In particular, at this stage, high BPS and high TPS are, in my opinion, not a meaningful step towards building a non-hypothetical financial system. Other words, they're saying that just to have fast transactions per second, fast blocks per second is not enough to build this chain. Now, this paper was written back in 2022. So since then till now, I mean, essentially he was kind of wrong because the value of this coin has absolutely skyrocketed, totally pumping, going to the moon. So back when this paper was written, the price of Caspa was 0 0.0002 dollars. That's like two tenths of a penny. Now we are sitting at 11 cents. When I made my other video, we were up at 14 cents. We've actually dropped almost 25% since I made my last video. So in terms of us being at a high, which we were close to all-time highs at 15 cents, you know, was I right? I don't know. We'll see in the long term. We are not through the bull market yet at all. We're still at the beginning. The potential of Caspa still to go up further in this bull market is definitely a possibility. But what I've been saying is not that Caspa is trash, not that any of this, it's about the entry point. And right now we are not early to Caspa. If you were buying Caspa back in June of 2022 at 0 0.0002, then you'd be early. So they're working on making Caspa coded in Rust instead of Golang, because I quote from Yonatan that the current CASPAD code base is an adoption of the Bitcoin client BTCD written in Golang. It enjoys a fine amount of technical debt and great code complexity, which makes it difficult for new folks to contribute. So as I was saying, it is difficult to add to this project right now. It still has a lot of ways to go. So I wanted to do a little more research into the founder of Caspa, Yonatan Sompolinsky, and what his track record is and his backstory. He was quoted, I guess, or referenced in the ETH paper, and that is a big narrative for a lot of people. It was left in the comments multiple times that he was quoted in the, in the white paper of ETH. I checked out his LinkedIn, and it's very, very sparse. Basically, his only experience, which seems to be kind of non-actual working experience is just education at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Now he does claim that he is at Harvard, going to Harvard, doing his postdoc at Harvard. Um, I'd be interested to find more actual evidence of this. There was one piece of document that says he is an associate researcher at Harvard. Now he hasn't graduated with a degree in Harvard. I don't really know how legitimate this guy is. I don't want to slander this guy because I don't know him and I don't know what he's done. But the thing is with crypto is that you just have to be so careful. It's so risky. There's no regulation right now. There's no protections. If these guys sell, disappear into the into the wind, there's really nothing, there's so little that can be done. So I always just always lean towards the extra, extra, extra cautious side of people's history. And I don't understand why on his LinkedIn, he doesn't have Harvard on his education. I guess maybe because he's currently at Harvard. So he has CC postdoc at Harvard University. If anyone has any more information on this guy being at Harvard, any proof, 
please share it. Put it in the comments. Would love to see it. Uh, I'm happy to just stand corrected. I'm just saying that it is a little weird. Also, he hasn't really worked anywhere. I don't know why he doesn't have any like coding education or, or, or coding experience or work experience. So this chart here shows the mining allocations of the coin and how much is being mined to certain pools, certain miners. And it doesn't look great. I mean, there's this unknown 52.9% is being mined into one place. And then we have all these other places, caspapool.org, arcpool, uh, woolpooly, you know, 6.3%, 15% here, 7% there, 0.3% there. That That's decentralized. That's great to see. But then he states that so then he has kind of a weird statement here that decentralization has more to do with the openness, permissionless level field nature of the market rather than the degree of heterogeneity in, in outcome. Fewer entities dominating mining is not in of itself a sign of centralization as long as they're unable to impose nonlinear rich get richer effects. I feel like decentralization is decentralization. You shouldn't have a massive amount centralized in one place. That's the whole point. And this right here is actually over 51%. So that doesn't look great. So inside of this paper, they have this tweet here from Mustafa Al-Bassam. And it says, as BTC goes more mainstream, its biggest threat, in my opinion, is the public perception of its increasing energy usage. The BTC usage is X percent of world energy. Narrative spreads more easily than BTC subsidizes renewable. Proof of work advocates need to play hard if they want to seize the narrative. Now, if you want to go with chains that use less energy, there's just proof of stake chains. And yes, they are a more vulnerable to attack than the proof of work chains, but it seems like they're working pretty well at this point. Uh, Ethereum seems to be working well. Avalanche seems to be working well. Solana has had its breakdowns. The proof of work aspect does add security, which is great to see, but there are also other chains like Kadena that also use very little energy, have super low transaction costs, and have smart contracts and are actually just seem technologically way ahead of Caspa, the narrative is just different. And I'm not just shilling Kadena. I think KDA is a very high risk project. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's dead. It could be dead. We don't know if it's going to come back in this bull cycle. Uh, I think it's possible. I think that is possible, it doesn't. Now, I did more research into the ghost DAG, into the DAG protocol and the difference between a blockchain. Now, one of their main narratives, one of their main points is that BTC is done in a linear chain. The blocks are on one line. So each block is attached to the previous block behind it. Now with ghost DAG, DAG standing for directed acyclic graph. Basically, it's like a tree or it's like a cluster of blocks okay it's not a block on a single chain it's multiple blocks attached to other blocks that then form from those other blocks now the caspa team does raise this circumstance where there is a risk in the security of bitcoin based on its uh chain mechanism and how they're on a single chain and there are these scenarios where multiple blocks can be forming in between the block time that it takes for the miners to ethically mine a block and that sometimes the block will basically not attach to that last one on the chain but will start a forked chain and this can create risk this can create a security breach where technically you don't need 51% to attack the chain. And they're saying essentially with block DAG that this wouldn't happen or be able to happen. Now, I do think with all of these things in these papers, a lot of this is, most of it is hypothetical because there's just not enough on the chain to really see if this is how it works. Now, Bitcoin is extremely secure. It is. It has been working for the last 10 years. There have been these few situations where the ordinals have been attacked. It says the United States has taken a keen interest in the cybersecurity aspects of Bitcoin, particularly focusing on a vulnerability that emerged with the ordinals, the ordinals protocol of 2022. So, what they're saying is that in real world terms, this means that the Bitcoin network could be spammed with non-transactional data, potentially clogging the blockchain, which in turn could impact its performance and transaction fees. This is not just a theoretical concern. The issue has been exploited as seen with Ordinal's inscription in 2022 and 2023. So there is this narrative, there is this storyline of Bitcoin security being at risk. Could that help Caspa? I would say so, but 
Caspa is still super young, super new, and saying, oh, Caspa is going to pass BTC, be the next BTC, I think that that is just beyond the scope of where we are price-wise, where we are uh, as an entry point into Caspa, and whether it's a good deal and a good buy, and whether we're still early right now.